Good afternoon, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I'm based in, in the UK. So uh, this discussion is going to focus on free trade advantages for India and the world. I, uh, I, I will make my opening remarks, then I'll uh, introduce my panelists and, uh, and we'll all go from there. Uh, India, like all countries, is a proud country. Uh, no country likes being told what they, what they do wrong. If anything, it can smack of neo-colonialism. We can focus on the glass half empty or the glass half full. There are some tariffs that were put in by countries in the past, which do not have red lines now, but they did when they were put in. We should focus on eradicating these tariffs to allow freer trade. The effect of a free trade agreement is that trade between countries rises by 50 to 175 percent within 10 years. The last point I will make is employment. When I was head of the European Parliament India desk, I came across a fact that for every 60,000 euros that the EU exported to anywhere in the world, it created one job in the EU. I worked out that if trade between India and the EU went up by 100%, not 175, one million jobs would be created in the EU and two to three million jobs in India. Think about it. If India does free trade deals with the whole world, how many extra jobs would be created in India? This is not to say that India has not done any free trade deals. There are quite a few free trade deals that India has done. But I think the focus, and this is my view, has been more on politics rather than economics in these trade deals. And that's why some of them have turned out to be uh, deficits uh, for India. I would now like to introduce Akshay Palla, managing partner KPMG North India, uh, Srita Heidi from Srita Heidi International in Germany, John West, director of Asian Century Institute Australia. Uh, there was a fourth speaker as well. Uh, but uh, he hasn't come, and um, perhaps he's having technical problems. So I will introduce him when he does come. Each speaker will speak for about four minutes or so. We will then, time permitting, have a panel discussion and open the floor to ask questions. I will give the panelists a warning if they exceed their time. And I must say that this discussion is being recorded. So, Akshay, over to you. Thank you, Dinesh, and uh, I guess my clock starts now, um, so i got to be sharp and to the point. But thank you for your opening remarks and, and, and really setting out, uh, you know, uh, why FTAs are beneficial uh, and how they've been leveraged and taken advantage of insofar as uh, 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 businesses, trade partners in country are concerned. And it's not, as we all know, it's not a new concept. Uh, if you go back to 1700s, uh, one of the world's first trade agreement was between England and Portugal, where English tariffs for wine imports from Portugal were made below those of France. And in exchange, English woolen cotton was uh, was, uh, was entered into Portugal tariff-free. So, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, since the colonial era, uh, trade deals being formulated and, uh, and, and sometimes they benefit uh, one party, uh, sometimes the other, but generally... Uh, is the initiator that sort of tends to benefit. Uh, how have the FTAs panned out for India thus far? Um, I think uh, uh, the number of FTAs in India have certainly increased, and so have their complexities. Uh, but the usage varies considerably uh, depending on which country the FTA is with. Uh, unfortunately, in India, we've got a number of issues which lead to um, uh, FTAs not being used that often. Those could be high compliance costs, regulatory barriers, low price margins, uh, overlapping trade agreements, which is something that has been unbound, uh, lack of uh, awareness of the benefits of FTA, 
and and thereby leading to lower usage by uh, by companies. Um, and 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 you know to the extent that you know we did a survey uh, only between five to twenty five percent of the companies in various industries have actually leveraged the trade deals to their benefit. So so you can see that it's not only that uh, there's lack of awareness, but I think uh, sometimes business is following trade deals. Uh, it should be it, it should be the opposite. The, the trade deals should follow the money, and I think that's something that's been corrected right now. And I think the opportunity for us for India to uh, get into trade deals with the West will hopefully create some of that balances. Now, the FDAs in India, uh, which have happened with the East, uh, have really hurt India's trade position. Um, the the uh, the adverse effect uh, of FTAs with some of the R RCEP members have uh, led to trade deficit doubling. Um, also, the ASEAN trade deal, which was well spoken, well heard, well read about, uh, eventually didn't work out to India's advantage because. Uh, only 10% uh, of the tariffs were kept from exclusion uh, for India, while ASEAN countries had a greater number of lines of exclusion. So it's not pretty balanced as such. Uh, and as a result, the, the trade deficit with ASEAN for India has tripled uh, to about $24 billion uh, last year vis-a-vis -vis what it was a decade ago. So, so and, and we're seeing similar sort of trends in, 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 uh, with South Korea, with Japan, and largely it's because uh, you know they are sending uh, you know goods back to uh, back to India, while you know we really haven't found the sweet spot of how to sort of uh, uh, react to that. Um, and also, there's a, you know lately there's been an issue in India about rules of origin, <clears throat> and 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 the fact that China has been using the ASEAN route to, uh, uh, to to sell goods in India, and I think that while they, they, there is a truth in that, but I think we see a lot of knee jerk reaction right now in our country and I think to that extent uh, uh, you know one will have to unbound that and have more data available to see what, where the issues are but the fact of the matter is and, and in my closing I'd say that India does need FDAs it, it, it just, you know we can't become a 5 trillion economy uh, if we don't uh, uh, create the market for our goods and services especially the goods especially those industries that are attracting PLI schemes uh, such as uh, apparel, footwear, furniture, toys, kitchenware, stationery, stuff like that. We have to go into mass manufacturing. We've got to scale up our uh, manufacturing base. And, and obviously, we've got to employ, uh, uh, you know, the 42.5% of our workforce that's in, in agriculture that's moving to the, uh, to the uh, industrial belts and the urban belts. So I think the, 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 uh, the work's cut out. Uh, they, they intuitively... Trade deals with Australia, with uh, EU, with UK, all make a lot of sense. I hope that uh, uh, we can quickly get onto it and get those uh, uh, implemented and delivered in a short period of time. Uh, uh, there is clear indication on some of the areas. For example, India can purchase all its LNG from Australia. That kickstarts the entire trade deal uh, uh, per se. So there are fire starters uh, to, to make these trade deals happen. The twenty percent of that your time, uh, Akshay. Okay. Yeah, so I'm almost so twenty percent can can come in, but uh, but yeah, uh, that was my closing comment that that we do need FTAs and the right FTAs. Dinesh. Thank you, Akshay. Welcome, Muzamil. Um, sorry, we missed you earlier, and uh, you, you, I hope you you know that you're next. So, Muzamil Abdul Karim is the CEO of the African Trading Alliance, based in Sudan. Welcome, Muzamil, and carry on. Thank you very much, uh, Danesh. Good morning from Khartoum, Sudan. It is an absolute pleasure to be part of such an extremely distinguished panel today. Uh, yes, I'm Muzamil Abdagreem, Chief Executive Officer of African Trade Alliance. We are an alternative investment manager and an independent investment bank that provides real economy-led strategic and financial solutions to an international clientele that are jointly looking to capitalize on East Africa's growth. So basically, with origin stretching back to 1958, our name has been associated with key economic backbone undertakings and transactions, uh, as well as pioneering new bilateral trade routes and markets, with India being a key contributor to our journey. Uh, so basically, for us to start speaking about India, we need to basically discuss uh, the kind of impact that India has on Africa right now. So just like many enterprises in Africa, India today contributes to approximately 31% of our commodity mandates, total revenues. We also look at the India-Sudan bilateral trade amounting to $1.14 billion and the India-Africa bilateral trade increased from around $7 billion in 2001 
to $78 billion in 2014. Yes, it has been affected now by COVID-induced uh, uh, issues, uh, putting it down at $66.7 billion, but that is also reflected at the commodity price decline. Uh, so basically, in 2019 to 2020, Africa exports to India equal to $37.7 billion, which is 8% of the total Indian imports, mainly crude oil and agri products. And India's exports to Africa was around $29 billion, contributing to 5.2% of the total African imports, which is mainly compri comprised mainly of uh, automotives, uh, heavy equipment, pharmaceuticals, and food stuff. Uh, where in Sudan, just like many other African countries, it's the same trend. We see brands like Mahindra, Tata, Bajaj replace many of the Western and Chinese brands across all industries and becoming a market standard, as well as commodities like Indian sugar and rice becoming the average consumer's choice. So today we even look at Bajaj alone, it sells almost 40% of its output to Africa. Unlike any other, India is a development partner for Africa, even during COVID-19 pandemic, it stood strong alongside Africa, providing 150 metric tons of medicine. These strong ties also come with strong mutual economic interests. With India's strong manufacturing capabilities, African countries are in need of these goods. And as well as India's fast growth needs the resource security available in Africa, like crude oil, which African crude oil import to India was almost non-existent two decades ago, but now accounts for almost a fifth of India's total crude oil imports. But we also see a lot of export of services and skills transfers for technology, as well as resource-based industrialization, being domiciled uh, in industrial zone hubs in countries like Ethiopia or Kenya which is also a rising trend across the African continent. When we look at the usual China-Africa trade numbers, they are very significant, sitting well over $200 billion. But when we look at the India-Africa trade at $65 billion now approximately, it may seem low in comparison. But if you look at, uh, take a uh, closer look at the growth, the graphs are actually skyrocketing. It is evident that India is not only looking to deepen ties with the continent, but truly really looking for a win-win relationship that is tilting more towards the continent's sustainable development now being the third largest trade partner to Africa after the EU and China. The detail that India takes in its trade policies has taken millions out of poverty in Africa. For instance, if you look at Sudan, there are niche agricultural commodities like pigeon peas, watermelon seeds, and red, uh, red sesame seeds that India has opened the door for as the key off-taker and significantly dropping the tariffs on them by relay motivating importers on one hand, and on the other hand, securing the livelihood of over 70,000 smallholder farmers and their families in rural areas. India has unilaterally provided free access to its markets for the exports of 33 least developed African countries. And in my opinion, this stops off any form of foreign aid coming into Africa. Now we also see the first FTA that was signed with Mauritius, the first one between all African countries this last February. So we also need to look at the key drivers behind India's success in Africa as well. And the first one must be uh, the historic friendship between Africa and India. While well, Africans look at the colonial times as a hostile takeover and the success of China in Africa as a long-standing strategic alliance, we especially look at India as a friendly merger, more or less our extended family. The reason is, for all the foreign diaspora in Africa, no one has been so deeply incorporated and embedded into the economic, political, cultural, and social fabric of the continent as the Indians did. Right now, we have almost 3 million diaspora, Indian diaspora in Africa. You'll find anywhere in Africa, you know, fourth generation Indian Sudanese, Indian Ugandans, Indian Kenyans, and more who hold a great place of respect within the communities. And this is due to their deeply rooted Indian value systems, strong sense of sincerity, work ethic, which are all qualities that they are well known for in Africa and greatly You'll admired. You'll have to wrap up, Mazano. Uh, so basically, uh, just to jump through, uh, we also need to look at the private sector approach towards uh, investments in Africa by India. Uh, while other countries are looking at state-to-state -state investments, India is looking at the private sector to private sector investment in Africa. Uh, and this is basically helps the Indian private sector to start navigating the risks and all of the economic and political cycles more efficiently. And even with the COVID slowdown, governments are now uh, actually looking towards fiscal uh, consolidation and recovery in their countries, which gives India the opportunity to actually, and the perfect timing to gear up their private sector towards accelerating their strategy and leveraging the potential of its productive sectors in Africa. So now that we have the AFCTA, which is Africa Free Trade Agreement, has been launched, connecting a 3.4 trillion economy and 1.3 billion people across 54 countries, no one has a sort of competitive advantage that India does has right now to capitalize on this opportunity and winning its ambitious uh, ambition as one of Africa's most important partners. Uh, by 2030, the African market size is expected to reach 0.7 billion people and a combined consumer and business spending 
of $6.7 trillion and uplifting almost 100 million people out of uh, extreme and moderate poverty. And to achieve this ambition goal, Africa has asked for the help of India for mechanizing agriculture, building infrastructure, driving logistic capabilities, as well as the help to transform the structural uh, status of Africa right now into more higher productivity and skills intensive industrials. Even yeah. though India's approach in Africa has been driven by the private sector, the Indian government has also taken strong initiative at that end from credit. And I mean, can, I, can I interrupt you? What I will sure. do is I'll certainly give you another chance um, as a retort afterwards. Uh, but let me bring in Srita now. But thank you okay. for your opening comments. Srita, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dinesh, my co-panelists and the deal participants. Very good morning. And thanks for Horatius for organizing and picking up this topic. So whatever I will be saying now is as an EU business advisor between EU, India and Indo-Pacific, as well as a delegate to the European Economic Committee. So after 16 rounds of talk between 2007 and 2013, there was a stop and we are all happy that in May 2021, India and EU have picked up the discussion on free trade agreement. When we are talking about EU and India, please let us keep in mind that we are talking about the two biggest democracies of the world. And um, my co-panelists have mentioned some figures, so uh, let me focus on two important points. One, the EU is India's third largest trading partner and accounting for almost, I would say, 63 billion worth of trade in goods in 2020. And the EU is the second largest destination of India's export after the USA. Some about, I would say, 6,000 European companies are present in India, providing at present directly, I would say, 1.7 million jobs. And that is going to rise up a lot more, as Dinesh mentioned in his opening speech. And indirectly, at present, 5 million jobs in broad sectors, which is also going to double up when we really achieve our aspired free trade agreement. So let me focus on the main differences on two points. Uh, where India and EU were having the differences so far, and how can both the democracies profit from each other, especially focusing on their agenda in the post-pandemic phase. So EU insisted that India should liberalize and reduce taxes on some sensitive products like automobiles, alcoholic beverages, dairy products like cheese, among others. And India's demand was to have a greater access within the European Union for its IT skilled professionals. And they were both not able to agree upon. So during the crisis, what happened, the pandemic, EU has realized there is a huge deficit in terms of digitalization, and let us keep in mind for the EU, the digital transition and climate change transition are very important on their agenda. To achieve the digital transition, EU is lacking resources and capacity and requires help from ex requires external support. So India's digital and service industry can really strengthen and further strengthen their position within the European Union market which auto automatically means you know, job creation, creating a win-win situation for both the EU and India agenda. Further benefits for India, I will say, as EU is the third largest trading partner of India, and if we get this aspired FTA, this means the Indian industries, Indian SMEs, will definitely have a greater access to the European Union market, and this will, on the other hand, also support the Make in India, Made in India campaign and giving the domestic economy a prosperity. India will also have a huge access to innovation and technology, solving some present challenges, meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goal 6, which has a lot to do with sustainable climate environment development and some topics like water scarcity. So for India, from the perspective of investment flows, and technological cooperation, the EU's assistance and investment will support also building up the smart cities and reaching the objectives on the smart city agenda. And India's advantages, um, further advantages are, you know, better integration into the world economy and strengthening its goal in the, in the role in the global trade governance 
um, finding a better place in the ranking list, which is published by the World Bank. For example, ease of doing business in India, where India is now on the 63rd and can rise much higher and um, aim for a better image. So way forward, I would like to make us aware of a few points. One, create a task force for India create a task force where business and trade is well represented, not on politics, parliamentarians, policymakers, and institutional bodies, but also business and trade should be well represented in the task force. Start negotiating with less difficult factors. Let us focus on the need of the time. For example, digitalization, as I said, so that we have success stories and we are willing to come back to the desk. India has to think also, you know, making some legislative and um, changes in institutional changes and rules and regulations in terms of labor, environmental rights, and both India and EU should, as Mujerwil said, that we should be, you know, aim as to become extended families and friends. So we should, you know, um, have a checklist how we can reach the eye level on, on reaching the quality and the meeting the quality and the standards um, in terms of export and import of uh, commodities. So I think that reaching an agreement uh, should always focus on bringing mutual benefit for both the sides. And it will be still a long journey coming back at the beginning, what I said, we are democracies. So there will be debate. We need to make compromises. But in spite of, you know, missing a lot of chances in the past, we have missed a lot of deadlines. Um, I personally think, and from this discussion, what I can take forward for further discussion, it's not out of reach. We have a lot of chances. Thank you very much. Four minutes. Thank you, Srikha. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I uh, now ask John West, um, last but not least, to give his um, ideas on how India can benefit from FTAs. John, go ahead. Thank you very much. It's, uh... It's difficult to say anything. I think everything has been said by my fellow panelists. But, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that India has actually been a successful trading nation over recent decades, particularly for IT services, pharmaceuticals, and other such things. At the same time, my second point is that India has not been successful in uh, export of labour-intensive manufacturers, uh, lower-skilled uh, manufactured products. Uh, and in that regard, Bangladesh is uh, doing much better than India, particularly when it comes to ready-made garments, clothing, textiles, and so on. So what does India need to do to, uh, to do better in trade? And, of course, this is the, the topic of our session. India should sign up to more free trade agreements, including with my own country, Australia. Uh, but the, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with Southeast Asia, I think is a very important thing, and India really should have signed up to that. It's disappointing that it didn't. But India must do more than just free trade agreements. India must improve its infrastructure, improve its education, uh, tackle corruption more seriously, uh, and tackle the, uh, the heavy bureaucracy. Now, Akshay uh, and, uh, expressed disappointment with trade with East Asia, that trade with East Asia is uh, resulting in trade deficits. I think we need to not worry too much about trade deficits, particularly given that India is actually uh, more uh, effective when it comes to services trade rather than merchandise trade. And also migrants' remittances are a very important part of the Indian story. But the most important thing is that if we look why countries like China and Southeast Asia succeeded in international trade, it's because they hooked on to international uh, supply chains global supply chains and to be a part of global supply chains you have to be attractive to foreign investors who will invest in your country and establish production facilities in your com country so that you can then export and apple the uh, the iphone maker that is the classic example china had massive investment from electronics companies from europe from the us and so on and that enabled these production facilities to be established in china and generate exports so when we're looking at trade, looking at free trade agreements, it's more than trade, it's more than free trade agreements. It's also foreign direct investment, which is critical to all of that. Um, I'd like just to conclude by saying that now many Western countries, including Australia, 
are nervous about their over-reliance on China as a trading partner. We're looking to diversify trade uh, with other countries. And India, of course, comes quickly to mind for everyone because India is the other big country in, in the world. So, in short, India's time has come, I think. India has a great moment in its economic history to be a, a better trading nation, and India should grasp this opportunity by opening up to uh, more trade, opening up to more foreign investment, and also improving infrastructure, education, bureaucracy, and corruption. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's, that's really concise and, and, and very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I would like to uh, just uh, make one comment before I go back to all of you to give your closing remarks, and that is that uh, Srita mentioned uh, ease of doing business at India 65. I remember when Mr. Modi came to power in 2014, it was in the 140s. I think it's 147 by from memory. And in seven years, it's gone from 140 to 65. And I'm sure it'll go into the top 25 soon. There is a, a people have sort of alluded to um, some, you know, bureaucracy, etc. cetera. Uh, there is a tax on unemployment, uh, on employment, uh, you know, on, uh, on income that you earn from employment. There is a tax on capital that you earn from your own capital. But there's also a tax on time. And it's the tax on time, if India can eradicate that for foreign uh, um, investment, foreign direct investment, uh, it would, you know, this thing about having a joint venture partner, uh, of course, you need a joint venture partner most of the time, but you don't have to have one, and so on. So this tax on time it is and protection to a certain extent, if they are taken away slowly, that will help um, India as well as the countries who want to invest in India. Uh, Akshay, let me go back to you and ask you for a minute's wrap up before we uh, have a discussion. If there are going to be sure. any questions, no, absolutely. And I think I think we have to be bullish about India. Uh, you know what we have seen, how India's uh, been able to uh, ride this last year and a half. Uh, I think one has to also take uh, some comfort in the fact that. Uh, certain parts of our economy have excelled. Uh, the FDI that we received in the last nine months, uh, albeit in some key sectors, has been you know almost uh, uh, five times what we received in the last eighteen months. And 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 also while the FDI growth has been negative worldwide, but in India has been thirty five percent. So and, you know we've had some uh, blockbuster IPOs. Uh, we've had uh, the right uh, capital attracting the right business. So I think at the end of the day, India does present a very healthy business environment for investments. But I think it, as far as international trade is concerned, as I said in the past, the trade agreements need to follow the market, the business. And I think uh, there, there are enough Indian companies who are looking to expand, to grow the manufacturing base, to sell in foreign markets. The international companies wanting to leverage uh, the fantastic schemes that the government has come up with, like the PLI scheme and create uh, manufacturing bases for the world. Uh, and I think it's in India's interest to, to implement with uh, laser focus because the long-term impact of that would be geometric. And I think these are very important years where the geopolitical lines have been redrawn, that India really creates the environment for uh, large private sector capital investments and in manufacturing capacity to be built for the world market. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. That's really kind. Uh, Muzamil. Here's your chance to finish off, if you like. Uh, you're on mute. All right, I think you can hear me now. So basically, what I'm saying is that uh, I just have some finishing remarks uh, that basically now that we see Africa is going towards this opportunity of the African Free Trade uh, Continental Agreement, uh, that basically India has a very strong monumental role to be playing in this. Uh, basically, now we already see that there's a mission now for India, which is called the 100 by 100 matrix, uh, which is a joint goal to drive the bilateral trade to $100 billion and investment to $100 billion by 2025. And this initiative is driven by the Indian Merchants Chamber of Commerce and Industry. 
So basically, I do believe this, well, this is a very ambitious goal. I do believe it can be further enhanced. Uh, first, by basically having some state-driven in in incentives, uh, like keeper finance with flexible terms and access, as well as tax cuts for Indian corporations that seek to deploy direct investments in Africa. Uh, but we also need to have, you know, the right formula uh, to basically increase the beneficial mutualities and touch points between Africa and India as well as minimizing the transactional costs between the continent and India as well. Uh, second, we also need to increase the trade missions between Africa and India. Uh, right now, they will increase to 47, uh, but, you know, th the more the better, I say. So this will not only help set the stage for a historic uh, Africa-India free trade agreement, but will also maintain a balance of value-add manufactured goods into India. India has so far an accumulated investment around $64 billion in Africa across all the various industries uh, across Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're speaking, that is. Uh, and basically, last before the least, is, uh, basically we need to model and set KPIs on the success factors for a free trade agreement. Uh, so basically, just like Ms. Rita said, uh, we need to have some sort of task force that basically comes down, they model uh, how it would look, the possibilities behind it, the objectives and the outcomes, or in more colloquial terms, basically wine and dine. So my point here is that basically Africa Currently, it's home to 30% of the world's remaining resources and 60% of the rural lands. Now, India and Africa is the perfect match by all means and measures to join forces in helping the global revival of the economy. And together, they can play a monumental role in shaping our far future. Thank you very Thank much, Mazamel. Thank you. If I may interrupt you, I, I, I know that you've gone on uh, for a few minutes. Uh, so is that, is, do you want to wrap up in about 10 seconds? Mozambique. Excuse me? Do you want to wrap up in about 10 or 20 seconds? No, no, no I'm done. Thank you very okay. much. Well, brilliant. Okay, great, <laughs> Srita. Your turn. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think, um, as I said, we need to have a very strategic approach between um, EU and India, or India and EU, has, uh, in order to take this forward. And it's good that uh, since uh, May uh, 2021, uh, it has started. However, uh, the task force, which I said, is very important because so far only parliamentarians, politicians, governmental bodies were included. And I really pledge the for, for this that uh, trade business uh, representative entrepreneurs are also included in this discussion. This is very, very important to have a practical approach. And I think that at the, at the early stage, I mean, where, uh, you know, till um, 2013, uh, the discussion was always, as far as I have, uh, I have experienced, the discussion was very much for, focused on what we cannot do. But let us start on, you know, the post-pandemic agenda. If you compare EU's agenda and Indian's agenda, then they are not competing with each other, but they are complementing each other. And let us focus on this. And I gave one point, which is digitalization, where there is really a win-win situation. And um, another important thing is that from India's homework, I think it has to be thought definitely that in order, you know, to make uh, develop such a free trade agreement, you have to make some legislative and regulatory changes in terms of labor laws, in terms of in environmental issues, but also, you know, in terms of, you know, minimum wages, working conditions, quality standards. So there you may need to develop a foundation where India and EU can meet on an eye level to a certain extent. And let us focus on the sectors also. Let us, in this discussion, develop a project management plan, taking phase one to phase two and phase three. This is what we have missed so far, a strategic approach. We've lost our moderator. Dinesh, are you there? Hi. 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 Sorry, I'm, I'm, my internet's playing up. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, so thank you very much. Um, so I didn't hear the, the last bit. But so uh, I just said that it is important to have a checklist focusing on the sectors, focusing on the functionalities so that this, you know, this discussion on quality standards, regulatory methods, etc. We need to meet a standard. We need to develop a foundation where we can have an eye level. No, understood. Not that. 
Uh, no, thank you very much, Rita, for that, those closing remarks. Um, John, go ahead. Sure, thank you very much. It's a very interesting discussion. I think that India needs to look at this part of the world that's been the most successful in the world over the last 75 years when it comes to international trade. That's East Asia. And, uh, and as I was said before, East Asia has been very successful in international trade through hooking on to global supply chains. And as actually said, India has been attracting more and more foreign direct investment for global supply chains. That's good. They need to do much, much more. India actually is now Apple, the uh, iPhone company, is now assembling iPhone 12 in India. So there are good signs that India is moving. We need much more than that. And one of the great secrets of China, uh, Thailand, Malaysia and so on in hooking into an international trade is creating special economic zones, special economic zones where companies can do their business free of regulations and tariffs and all that sort of stuff. And you can organise a special economic zone overnight. You don't have to go through trade negotiations for years and years and years. And so I think looking at the China model is very important. So my key message is hook on to global supply chains, being more open to foreign direct investment, as you are now, but you can do much more better, and special economic zones is a quick way of doing that. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, I, I don't know where the questions are. Unfortunately, I don't know this platform very well. But uh, I, I just wanted to summarize what I learned, and perhaps you could, could add um, anything that I've missed out. Um, so the first point that I made was employment. There's employment on both sides, not just in India, uh, if you if increase exports and if, if you increase trade. The second point is the, although there's, there's a, the Indian experience on FTAs, free trade agreements, our deficits more with East Asian countries, you also get money being sent back to India in terms of uh, uh, people sending money to their relatives and investments in India. The third point I, I learned was that Africa is doing well with India. India and Africa are really doing well. Of course, they can do better. Uh, it's a lack of friendly merger. It's like a family. There are three million um, Indians who have been there in Africa for some time. And the biggest potential in the whole world for India is Africa. I the way I look at it, with, with, with all the resources that that, uh, that Africa has, and um, and China's in this too, of course. Uh, Shrita's point about needing IT people and technical people for both, for the digital work that's supposed to be done in Europe as well as climate change, it's really important because uh, India has a lot of uh, people in the IT sector, and they are being produced and churned out with very good skills. Um, ease of doing business, um, 65, should get to the top 30, top 25. This is great. Um, I, I'm a, on the global board of Thai, which is an entrepreneur's organization. And uh, I don't know if any of you that there are a lot of unicorns being produced in India, and a lot of sunicorns being produced in India, uh, um, who are going to be unicorns very soon. And I just feel that uh, uh, we, we were not looking at that infrastructure. Um, uh, there are about 35 that have come out in the last three years. Akshay, you can obviously um, say yes or no to that. And uh, Business, it seems, has been given a back seat in free trade agreements when governments negotiate with each other, and that's my view, and, and, and I see Akshay nodding. And I just feel that if business is given a, a, a better uh, role and, and, and more front seat, we would do far better on deficits and, 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 and everything else, and employment. And, and lastly, uh, in, in my view, Building Rolls-Royce in a free trade agreement is not the deal. Each meeting should produce a quick, quick win. It should produce uh, lo the low-hanging fruit. We don't have to go right to everything. Otherwise, the whole deal 
collapses. Uh, this is so important that, you know, you climb a ladder, it's one step at a time. And this is what we really need to focus on. Uh, have I missed out anything, guys, that, that you made? Um, there is a question as well. Um, but I, Sanjeev, I think, had a question. And I was just wondering if you can come in uh, now, Sanjeev. I'm not sure how we do this, but he's in the room. Oh, okay. I think he's got the mic now. Okay, Sanjeev, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a... Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there he is. Hi, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. So, you know, I, I completely agree with uh, the uh, the comments that you just made, uh, Dinesh, if I may. I, 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 you know, if you look at if you look at what's, you know, we are entrepreneurs, we are businesses in Africa, global business. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, you see what's happening in China, you see what's uh, what's uh, driven policy policies that are driven uh, from Beijing. Uh, the point is, uh, I have not seen that sort of excitement on, uh, there is, there are conversations in New Delhi about uh, free trade agreement, but nobody understands what that free trade agreement might look like. There is a bit of pride that comes in that it has to be, uh, you know, an, an agreement that should work for India. Uh, but, you know, my question is, I have not, so far, I have not seen a very strong effort, which is led by, you know, let's say Confederation of Industries in India, business people who know what they're doing, uh, and then politicians, ministries supporting it and saying, yes, give us a blueprint because, look, there is an engagement between India and Africa. There is an engagement between entrepreneur level, between uh, various countries. Now, why don't the government creates some sort of uh, committee. I don't know. I mean, I'm not the government. Uh, and then let the entrepreneurs drive it. That, look, we, these are these are the goals that we want to achieve. This has to work. Uh, and let's put a framework and let's give us, our, uh, give us a timeline to achieve those free trade agreements. So that's something that I wanted to ask uh, all of you and wanted to know, wanted to get your take. Sanjeev, thank you very much for your question. Um, anyone want to take that? We've got about three minutes. So, uh, so I, Sanjeev, I, I completely agree with you. I think, I think uh, somewhere, uh, I think the FTAs have, have been sort of chevrons uh, uh, more than you know business agreements in the past. Um, and, and I think the, uh, the business bodies, the uh, the confederation of industries, etc., have to play a much larger role. Uh, you know, we work uh, quite considerably with uh, different trade bodies within the government and and uh, and try to implement a lot of their policies. I think the challenge sometimes comes in, uh, in, in in configuring the discussions in a manner that allows for uh, one to understand the trade, uh, the trade first and then the trade agreement to follow. So I completely agree with you. And I think uh, as, a, as a country, uh, as industry in India, we need to do more to get the seat on the table at the design phase rather than complaining about it once the FDA is signed. If right. I can add a comment, um, there's a danger of working too closely with business. Business obviously likes to have markets opened up in other countries, but business typically wants protectionism at home. And yeah. uh, if we sit around the table with uh, business leaders, they'll say, you know, stop all these exports coming from, uh, imports coming from China and Indonesia and so on, when in fact, you know, that's the wrong thing. You know, uh, the last thing you want business people to do is ask uh, ask that they uh, the market is protected, and so listen to business. But I think not have them there negotiating. You know, no, totally, early... uh, totally agree with you, John, uh, because it it that, that's where the government uh, should provide leadership. Um, 
Go ahead, Srika. Um, only, only one small point. I, I, I agree to you uh, uh, what you said, uh, Sanjeev, that um, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, business people in India are have less access to what's going on at present. Um, however, however, on the 8th of May, uh, the Prime Minister, together with some group of entrepreneurs from India, were having a very, very good discussion in setting up the final agenda with all the 28 member states um, in the European Union. And definitely what is missing is the external communication. Media is not treating it as an important topic in India, but in Europe it's happening. Because for Europe, the Indo-Pacific agenda, India should be on the driver's seat. And I agree to you, I think the network with the business and the entrepreneurs world, and, and I'm saying it's not only, you know, it's a task um, for government and political institutions. Entrepreneurs should be on task force. Brilliant. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me just uh, uh, thank you uh, by name, Akshay. Uh, thank you. Great, great to, to meet you. Great to get to know you. Monamil as well. Lovely meeting you. Srita, we should meet. I'm, I'm in Europe. You're in Europe. We should meet. And John, uh, when Australia opens up, then it might be three years from now. <laughs> I, will, I will see you. <laughs> so Australia thank you, guys. Has, Australia much. has the longest economy of all the advanced economies now. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm sure. so Thanks, thanks for coordinating and moderating. Thank you, well, you fantastic. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much indeed. Thank you very much. You. And uh, I will uh, uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.